Hello and welcome to Open Door. Today in the hot seat moderating the debate is Catherine Howe, Chief Executive of Public Eye and also involved with uh, the City Camp Brighton. Catherine, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is about Local Democracy Week and what local democracy looks like today and hopefully into the future. Um, what we, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves and we've already had some questions from the online audience. Um, but just while they're introducing themselves, I'll let them think about, we're going to open by talking a little bit about what good democracy actually looks like. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves, Warren. I'm Councillor Warren Morgan. I'm leader of the Labour and Cooperative Group on Brighton and Hove City Council, which is a post I've had for getting on for six months now. Brilliant. Uh, I'm a little bit longer than that. As leader of the Conservative Group, many years really, I suppose. Um, leader of the Conservative Opposition Group on Brighton and Hove City Council. Um, I'm Hannah Ward-Penny and I'm Young Mayor of Brighton and was elected by the Brighton and Hove Youth Council. Brilliant. So w welcome, everybody. So, so kicking off, I'm going I'm to start with you, Geoffrey, because I, I, as, as you've got most experience, that what, what for you does look good democracy look like? I think it is representing what one's electors actually want. And certainly in my ward of Patcham, we really go out of our way to put our names, our addresses. If you go into the local libraries, you can't miss uh, the three of us as councillors. Our home addresses, our telephone numbers, and our emails. We have an enormous number of emails as well so that we can communicate with our electors. So really, for me, it is actually representing and um, advocating, supporting um, what the majority of our electors actually think and want. Now, they don't all think the same thing. This is the trouble. <laughs> but you try and uh, represent the majority view, discuss things with them, and then put that, put that over. Brilliant. That, to me, I think is really important. Brilliant. And Warren, is that, is that how you see good democracy? I think uh, people's idea of democracy is changing. I think people nowadays, it's so much more easy for them via Twitter, via social media, to express a view. It's so much more easy for them to take a, a choice in so many things. So I think to come to a collective endeavour, such as democracy, is, is a little more tricky. I think what politicians like us have to do is to ensure that the, the very very views that, that Jeffrey was talking about, that people feel that they have had a say, that they have put their point of view and that a decision has been come to in, in a way that is fair to everyone. Brilliant. Jason? Um, I think well, it's got to be open, transparent, accountable. There has to be, um, as politicians, we have to reach out to help people um, express their views and be aware of things that are happening through their public services. But I also think there's an element of leadership, that sometimes issues are coming forward on our horizon that the general citizenry may not be aware of. And we need to say, well, look, this is the direction we think things might be going in. What do you think about that? So we sometimes have to lead the charge on some things. Um, and, and obviously, there's an element of um, being an ambassador for your area. So whether it's, it's not only in the government circles, but we might go out to big employers or other parties and say, you know, we're proud of our area, we think we can do something positive. So there's that outward facing element as well. Brilliant. I mean, you, you're all to a greater and lesser degree talking about how getting people involved and making sure that their involvement is meaningful and that you're reflecting what they think. Is, is actually what, are, are you content with the ways in which people can get involved at the moment? And, and do you think that people are aware enough of the different ways in which they can get involved in local democracy? I think it's ex extremely difficult. Um, I was knocking on doors the other day uh, over a scheme which was quite near where people lived. Many of them didn't know anything about it at all. And yet the council had really done its best to, uh, to publicise and to tell people you know, what, what could happen and to get their views. We took it upon ourselves to knock on doors to actually yeah. ask people it is extremely difficult unless you put uh, something through every single person's letterbox and hope that every person in that house or flat or wherever actually reads it. Um, and of course, one partner might put it in the bin and the other say they haven't received it. So it's not an easy, but I think it will get better in the future when far more people are on email so that you can quickly email um, uh, and ask people, what do you think? And it's much easier that way. I, I think that will be the future. Okay, so the, fu the future is email. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Warren, the future is email? I'd say the future is more Twitter, more Facebook, where if a community is engaged in an issue, is concerned about an issue, then that through Facebook, through Twitter, through those kind of social media um, will, will generate some concern and it's a way for us to engage with, with residents as well. And it's not just uh, you know, us broadcasting our views to them, it's them communicating with us, it's us informing them of, of the kind of decisions and, 
and, and issues that, that Jason was talking about and us coming to, if not an agreed position, at least a point where we can see why a decision has been made the way it has been made. Jason? Well, I'm not going to, I've been in the technical world long enough not to pick a technology as the winner <laughs> for the future. Um, but, I mean, certainly the two-way conversation is much easier now than it was. Uh, you know, it's not a notice in the paper and that's the end of it. Um, but it's certainly a challenge that no matter how much technology we've brought to bear and that we can certainly go further, people have got busy lives, their lives are getting um, more complicated, they're getting more different channels of communication and people are living less um, orderly lives and that we've got people working all sorts of different patterns and all sorts of patterns in home life that to put, simply have one way of communicating is not going to be enough. Um, so that's certainly a challenge. Um, but we also, one of the interesting things about the online sphere so far has been it's been the interested and the active getting more effective and active rather than a vast way that the uninvolved getting more involved. Mm -hmm. And I think we all instinctively would like more people to be aware and involved, but we haven't seen a massive um, sweeping change in that. We live in hope. Yeah. I'd like to I'd like to bring Hannah in at this point because you know as, as, as yeah. you know I'm, I don't mean to ask you to speak for all young people <laughs> but how how do you talk to, to the people that you're representing? Well, I think lots of people I mean adults always seem to assume that young people are really on the internet all the time and if you put it on Facebook everyone's going to know about it but I don't think that's really the case. I mean, um, I think more people would know about things if politicians or councillors came into our schools a lot more because I know that speaking to my school in assemblies makes them more aware of the Youth Council. And I think a lot of other people in the Youth Council talk to their schools, and that's how they become more aware of the local politics. But you can't just assume that putting everything on the internet is going to make every young person aware of everything that's going on. Because yeah. in, in, in some ways, you're just, you're just broadcasting in a different kind of way just yeah. by putting it out there. So, so, so if, we talk, if we fix back on this, uh, this point about people getting, people getting involved, and it's, uh, it's not just how can you reach them, but how, how can they reach you, can I just ask, sort of, how, how do, how do, at the moment, how do you get information from your residents? How do, how do you listen to the people you're representing? Well, can I just say, first of all, um, unless people are really against something strongly, then generally speaking, you don't hear from them. It's generally an issue that they're concerned about, mm -hmm. either a personal one um, or something going on in the area. And it's very interesting if you actually knock on doors and you ask, you know, residents, mm -hmm. you know, have you got any concerns? And very often, no, nothing at all. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly a really big issue crops up and they get involved. And, so, and so, yeah, so this sort of relates to what Jason was saying. Absolutely, was, uh, but, Jason, but, but, are we, yeah. but, but doesn't, aren't we sort of ending up in a position where democracy is for the active, is, is yes. for the active citizens? Yeah. And, and are, we ha are we content with that as the position? And I think that is a challenge. I mean, each year with our budget process, we have tried and previous administrations have tried various ways to engage people. It's an issue that touches everything that the council does for the yes. city, but it's also so big and complicated that you often get the, no matter what the format, the same yes. voices get participating. Yes. And so yeah. how we can break some of these issues yeah. down to make them more accessible, because yeah. there's a huge amount of business and decision yeah. making that comes through the council yeah. every yeah. month. And people will go, well, I didn't know about that. Yeah. And we can say, well, it was published yeah. on the website, yeah. and we did a press release, yeah. and it went to the local paper. But actually, if you all put all those mediums together, you might have hit 15,000, 20,000 people, possibly, and mm. we've got 280-odd thousand people living in the city and even more visiting and working. So it is an ongoing challenge, no doubt. And, but I think uh, the yeah. diversity of the way people contact all of us, you know, mm. whether it's email, Twitter, less, yeah. I have fewer and fewer in the actual physical post box. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so this is this is actually the point at which some of the questions we've had online yeah. is is coincide with what you're saying. So start, starting with Warren, which is that there's a lot of cynicism about the consultation process yeah. as being the route that the thing that actually manages that yeah. interface. Um, and and I'd quite like to know your your comments on how how do we either do we need to address the cynicism that actually why you know sort of why consult because we never get to get answered or actually do you think that there are ways of doing that, that this would which, which would be more effective so do you want to kick off for it it is an immensely difficult challenge i think as, as the others have said you can put leaflets through doors but it doesn't guarantee that they'll be read you can put things online but it doesn't guarantee that it'll it'll reach your your target audience uh, i think it has to be a, a, a sort of multiple approach by community meetings by door knocking via the, the traditional kind of media, via social media, and it's, an, it's got to be an aggregation of those things. I and mean, obviously there are, there are consultation means that are imposed on us in terms of rules and regulations that we have to follow. And I think it's a way of enhancing that and getting feedback each time we do it 
to find out why people who, who didn't engage with it didn't engage. Um, and all we can do is learn from that process. I, I suppose I just want to push you, you guys slightly more on that because sort of one of the things that we're hearing again, you know, sort of on, online and from my experience of, yeah. you know, talking to people in the city, which is that people feel that they want to be consulted but they feel they're not being heard or that they're not hearing, maybe hearing the results of that consultation. So maybe it's the feedback loop is part of this as well. Well, I mean, it's tricky. First of all, you can get consultation fatigue. We know that sometimes people actually get fed up with being asked too much with you know, multiple page forms and so on. The other thing is we talk about consultation here as if all consultation is equal, but there's many different types of consultation. You have a consultation on the principle of something. You can have a consultation on the practicalities of how that thing we've already agreed going to do is actually going to work on the ground and, and a whole variety in between. So we need to kind of nuance it a bit. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, is that consultations are just that. They are not a referendum. And so sometimes you do get um, expectations running out of sync with what the, the council's perspective on a consultation is. But I, if you look through the history of consultations, the last decade I've been involved in one way or the other, is um, most of the time, say on parking zones, they've only gone ahead when the consultation has been a majority in favour. And that's not that's been across parties. So. Um, you know, looking at the actual track record, maybe it is one of feedback. I don't know. But the other interesting thing relating to what Geoffrey said earlier was when back when I'd just been elected as a ward councillor, there was consultation on communal bins going out. Mm -hmm. And it was very noisy. You thought, gosh, it was the worst thing that ever happened from the noise you got. Well, they went in, and then lots of people afterwards were saying, gosh, aren't they brilliant? Mm -hmm. And they'd never said a word in the consultation period up to that yeah. because they felt silence would be taken as acquiescence but they weren't yeah. making yeah. that. And so it's very difficult to balance all these things that we might, as ward councillors, know actually there might be a silent majority. But if they're silent, it's very difficult for us yeah. to politically mm -hmm. explain that. I mean, this is a problem because when you look at consultations and you drive them down to individual roads or areas, it can be just a very small proportion who actually respond. And therefore, when what comes before the councillors is that X number, that the majority are in favour, but it's actually only the majority of a small number who responded. Yeah. And therefore, all those who haven't responded, for one reason or another, think, well, I haven't been taken into account. There is the other issue, of course, just following on again from what Jason was saying, that if you take parking zones and you therefore ask people in a particular road, they can have one view, but in other roads, they have a different view. And it's getting the majority and the people who haven't been consulted because they're not in the area and could well suffer the consequences haven't been consulted it's a it's very very difficult I, I, I mean, and I think everybody would, everyone could see that and I guess the the, the quest, the, perhaps the thing to pursue here is that the consultation is just one tool in the decision-making yes. process yes. Um, and that perhaps to address the you know, a need to have trust in that bit of the process. It's about how do you build trust in the whole decision-making process. Yeah. Um, and I'd like us to ask particularly about how do you make it a more open, how do you make decision-making more open? So from my world of sort of digital democracy, this is very much about a, a, an open data position, but also about how do you build transparency into every stage of the decision-making so that actually when you take decisions, people can look at those and think, yes, I can trust that decision. Do I start with you, Warren? I think you, you, you've got to go out there and talk to people, engage with the communities at the earliest stage, and whether that's meetings or doing it online or, or, or via some other means, to engage people in the very early early stages of discussion. Because I think by the time people become aware of an issue, they often feel that the decision has already been made. And I think we need to both present the options and, wherever possible, give people some practical examples. I mean, the example that Jason gave of, of the communal bins, if you can take someone to an area where they are already being used and show and get them to talk to local residents and find out the pros and cons, the benefits of the bins being there, the downsides in terms of noise and loss of parking, at least people can make an, inform, an informed choice and then put that to their councillors who then go to the chamber and vote on it. Jason? Yeah, well, it's, it's, as you say, it's a multiple channel thing. And I, I mean, I think the ultimate problem we have is the, is the cynicism in some consultation go, oh, well, you know, it's just a consultation, that kind of view. Well, it becomes self-defeating to an extent. So we do need to work extra hard to be um, open and accountable, um, attend as many community meetings as possible. But we have a challenge whereby, while simultaneously, I say, Twitter and Facebook and email are getting busier, actually, attendance at some community meetings is declining. So, um, 
And it's clear that meeting in person is still the most powerful way of engaging and reassuring mm. people, and they can actually see um, how things are. And I've been to school meetings recently where the teachers tried to stop the children asking about current topics of interest. They want to just talk generally about politics. And I said, no, let's talk about the specific issues. If they're interested and aware of it, that's perfect. So I think we need to keep trying to um, keep those real-life community meetings going. They, they, they can't be dismissed just because we have the online sphere. Yeah, uh, no, completely agree. But, 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 is, but isn't part of what you're saying that you need to keep the decision-making process open, genuinely open throughout the decision-making? And so that perhaps one of the difficulties is that by the time you're actually often talking about, by the time you're actually talking about where are we going to put the bins, actually mm. there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of th there's a lot of things in train, which means that actually changing that decision is difficult. So so openness is not just about the transparency point, but openness is about actually holding holding the decision open until you have had sure. chance to talk I mean, to just people. Just one little thing to say. I mean, we have in my ward 25% turnover in the vote of. Um, registration each year. So you could have had the discussion about, well, how are we going to deal with bins and have the, you know, showing them where it was elsewhere. But a quarter of those people have moved by the time you get to the next phase and the new people come and go, what's this thing about bins? Just an example. So yeah. there is a challenge in that as well, that you could end up keep going back and round and round mm -hmm. the same discussion yeah. because of the just, because of the way our city is in some areas. But uh, yeah. yeah. Je Jeffrey, what, what do you think, you know, sort of about the idea of, can, can you hold the decision open long enough so that actually you can get meaningful participation? Well, once you've gone out and consulted, unless you keep on consulting, it's very difficult. But can I just draw you on to a different um, point? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. And, <laughs> well, and, and you did allude to it. What has concerned me uh, over many years is to whether we are actually getting the, uh, the actual voices or the, the, I'll say the right people, that's probably the wrong terminology, but when you get a group of people forward for consultation, you know, are they really representing what the views of the wider city? You get a number of people who put themselves forward uh, to give their views. And, and I think that this is a difficulty, actually encouraging people to come forward, whether they're interested in sports, they're interested in uh, any, any sort of topic. Uh, it'd be really interested, and I'm sure council officers, yeah. and we would also appreciate getting their views but how do you, how do you so, 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 all right, so let me put the question back yeah. to, to, to you as a group and, 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 and Hannah as well, is that what's the one thing that as politicians you could do differently that would include a different group of people? Well, there's a scientific way of approaching it, um, as business does, in terms of engaging a focus group and pollsters and market researchers. But obviously that carries with it a cost and the risk that people will say, well, I wasn't selected to be in that group and therefore my voice isn't being heard. So again, it comes back. So you're to saying science is the answer. Uh, it, it's one of the answers. It's one of the tools. Uh, and as Jeffrey says, the council does does use that from time to time. And I think it's a, it's a balance. You've got to look at you've got to look at what's representative. You've got to, to to get in as many voices as you can. You've got to, as Jason says, take a lead yeah. on some issues and say this is where we want to go and why we want to go there. But do that in a way that doesn't make people feel that the decision has been made. So, 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 so you're, you're, the thing that you would change is uh, is, actually, is actually to start to, to, to use you know, sort of more representative sampling and to, to, to actually go out and find those other voices. I think that helps balance against the other results that you get in to yeah. see whether whether we are getting a true yeah. picture of people's opinion. So, well, we have had citizen panels on and off, which are that you know scientific model. I mean, it is difficult to, you know, being honest, if a councillor in a, you know, meeting has got a protest group with petitions and all of that in the room there versus the cool light of a citizen's panel report, you know, we can ex understand the trade-offs are going to be tricky. Um, I personally think that the challenge really is to councillors and others to find ways to put more time into reaching their communities and engaging that. And I say that knowing full well that councillors generally are part-timers trying to hold down yeah. jobs and live their lives as well, yeah. and that is very tricky. But there is this kind of crossover between community development, social worker, politician, community yeah. champion that can yeah. keep people up to date on what's going on. And that, that is more than a full-time job if, yeah. if done yeah. to the level that we perhaps might want. And, and I suppose this leads us into, an, into another question which, um, which yeah. I'll put to Jeffrey and then I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Hannah to comment, which is, is there just too much process? Is there, is, is actually, is, is, there, is there too much bureaucracy around some of this stuff, which means that you spend more time on that than actually out there finding the views of people? Sorry, I think you're going no, to ask, oh, no, 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 going no, ask no, me. No, yeah. um, there is, I think email does help. Um, I try and encourage my electors when they telephone me, if they can possibly put it with an email, 
that makes it so much easier for me because I can then just send it off to officers, get a response and send it back again. Mm -hmm. But Jason's absolutely right. It, it, where he says it's up to the councillors to be active and try and get the views of their communities and that's certainly what we try to do in our ward. We go to our local action team meetings, we do our regular surgeries. I did, I did actually ask for a poll at our last patch from that local action team meeting on a particular road for 20 miles an hour. But, I mean, there was only something like 25 people there. Uh, but it was interesting because it was a very big one, one particular way which gave me a little bit of confidence when this comes up that I've got the majority, at least of those there, thinking in that particular yeah. direction. But it's really for council, and it's a very, very busy job. Yeah. Because the more you, you deal with people, you go back for the answers, and then they come back to you, and you go back again. Yeah. But it, it's really, you feel a sense of achievement when you're able to... Um, yeah. Try and help people. And and, and and I think you know. So I think that's why uh, uh, you know it's a it's a really it's a really important role. And the, the question is, how, how could it be different, and how might it be different in the future? So I was sort of so for, I was going to ask Hannah if, if you were going to say to these guys, what what could they change, perhaps, to reach a different group of people from your perspective? What do you think? What do you think could change? Well, I think everyone's been saying that we should really reach a wider range of people to give these consultations to. But I think young people have maybe my age don't feel like their voice is getting heard enough I mean people do come with problems to the youth council but even from the youth council I don't feel like the councillors maybe sometimes they don't take us as seriously as maybe adults do when we have the same I think we equal in opinion and I think what would be better is if although councillors have been saying that they should come into schools more often and listen to the views of young people that it's never actually happened and I think going to schools and meeting the young people themselves is quite a good idea. Mm. Does it, do you want to, want to comment on well, that? I'd, well, I'd, I'd love to be invited more to schools. I love it. It's great every time. Um, I think we've all been doing it recently. Um, so, you know, I think we'd all be up for that. We just need to fit it into the, the timetables. Okay. For, for so, 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 yeah, so, we so, do. So we can't invite yeah. ourselves, no. unfortunately. Okay, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an outbreak of agreement with Hannah's yeah. suggestion, which was, so, so I think you've won your point, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is to make sure that these guys do get, 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 out, of, get out of schools a little bit more. I, I mean... Going back there on the on the, the other point about sort of like the, the sort of the trust the trust point is the question here about whether or not actually you know because you're all really busy and because also budgets are shrinking and that's the same across all, all of the public services it, it is actually is some of this about collaborating more effectively both with the community and with with other public bodies so I guess how do you see that that kind of collaboration working in the future and and how are you going to make sure as the democratic representative that that, that collaboration with other services is still democratic Jeffrey hmm. well uh, it's difficult in as much as actually local government local councils are the most democratic because we're all voted if we don't um, serve our electorate uh, we could well be voted out uh, other public bodies obviously are not democratic in that sense you can have shareholders uh, who give views on, on the company so oh, it yes. is difficult but we do have regular meetings you know, with economic I, partnerships. I, I just want to sort of push a little yeah. bit on that, which is which is that you know, sort of, in the, in in when you're having to collaborate, you're right. You you bring the voice of your elected, you, the people that you're representing, and that can either make you sort of more nervous of actually, am I going to stay elected? or it is an opportunity to show leadership in that collaboration, which is actually, because I have a mandate, I sh we should be being a little bit bolder. And, and if we are going to not just partner with people, but properly see public sector collaboration, how, are you, how do you see your role as democratic leaders in actually making that collaboration work? Well, I was at a, an event yesterday in, in Whitehall on, um, yeah. on financial inclusion, and there were residents there, there were, there were professionals there, there were people from, from the council and from other bodies and you know, we, we talked about the issues on, an, on a level playing field and you know, all you can do is engage in the discussion with the information that, that you have. I think there, ideally there's a way forward in terms of, of public services being more community led um, but that has to carry with it I think some, some budgeting. I think if you're going to ask people to give up their time in their neighbourhoods and come forward and, and make some decisions, then they need to, to have some control over the budgets, which is not easy. Um, so that is potentially one of the, the, the routes forward. And I think all of the parties have, 
have looked at neighbourhood councils or some form of, of, of neighbourhood involvement uh, in the past. It's it's a question of making it work, and it may not work in the same way in each neighbourhood. Really quickly from Jason, and then I've got I've got another questions coming online, which I want to try and get round. We'll okay. start with you. Well, uh, it, it's it is tricky. It is definitely tricky, um, and I think uh, you know the, there needs to be a culture shift, both politically and in the professional ranks of public services. Um, so that it's not a kind of, you are fortunate to receive this public service that we designed in our ivory tower, and it is a working together. And we are seeing that um, happen, and there's, there's the shift of the, the clear political consensus, for example, on social care being integrated with health is a sign of collaboration being mainstream. So mm -hmm. I think it, it's happening, but it will be a very slow shift when we've had a very top-down method of delivering public services with councillors at the top, you know, officers advise, councillors decide is the old way of doing it. Um, it's, and it's a learning process. So we need to support councillors and candidates for council in that cultural shift. And we have to think about the kind of training we offer them. Brilliant. And, and, and this is a, an excellent segue into the last question that we've had that's come in online, which is the, the, this shift from hierarchy to networks. Mm. Could, do you want to comment a little bit on how social media is changing the way in which these dialogues are happening, both you know, with, you know, between organisations but also with your communities? And, Geoffrey, because I cut you off the last question, do you want to kick off? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've already discussed the fact that this is the future. People can very quickly send a tweet. Uh, while they're sitting on a train or they can give their views very quickly. Uh, we can communicate back. It's quicker that way uh, than the old pen and ink days. Uh, so I think this is definitely the future. Boy? I think there's, there's an awful lot that, that's happening online. I mean, I'm very active on Twitter uh, and, and Facebook. I think there's, there's a way that we can account, even if it's just accounting for our day, the kind of things that make up what a politician does makes us a bit more identifiable, a bit more mm -hmm. human. It helps us overcome some of the stereotypes that the media puts out about politicians. Uh, and hopefully it encourages some more people, some younger people. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the next generation of, 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 of voters will only engage with politicians if we look more like Hannah and less like us uh, and, and yeah. talk about the kind of issues that, that you know, they're filling out a petition on, an, on a vase or yeah. 38 degrees or something like that. And I think it's, it's making the link between the, the single issue um, petitions and you know, a system of government that um, will, will make people engage a bit more. And that comes back to us getting into the schools and, and explaining that. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the challenge of the kind of quick single issue campaign online versus the, um, the, the pragmatic um, and party related issues of running in government are, there's a bit of a gap there. And we're in a kind of, uh, in the middle of a shift. So we say we're in a network world and deference is reduced. But at the same time, people will be very quick to say, oh, you know, you're leader of the group. Why don't you tell X, Y, and Z to do something? So they want it both ways sometimes. That we want it to be top down but telling us what to do via Twitter. So there's a challenge there, but I think you know what's been said before is absolutely right. This is more responsive, great opportunity to explain what we're doing, why we're here, and to respond quickly. And the number of times I've been able to resolve queries about why this road's closed, why that's done very briefly online through Twitter or something, has been positive for all involved. And and then the newspaper reports it the next day after the whole issue's blown over. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, you know it's clearly positive, but the risks are great as well, so we need to be careful and, and respectful as we go forward. And, and would you say that this is one of the biggest risks, the biggest changes around the role of the councillor, um, you know, the, the use of the technology and, and, and the fact that yeah. people are tending to participate through single issues rather than joining parties? Is that the biggest change or is there a bigger one? I think, that's, I, I think that's the biggest change, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's two ways of looking at emails. Um, on the one, you get loads and loads of communications um, which is very very good and you then send them off very very quickly uh, on the other hand they're coming in 24 hours a day as it as it were yeah. whereas letters would you pick your post up you know once a day as it were decide what you're going to do you can't do that with emails um, yeah I, yes I, I wish I wish I could do that with yeah. emails <laughs> so, 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 so do you two both think that, that these are the are these are the biggest challenges in terms of changing the role at the moment and I, I, yes, the, the statistics overall do suggest that, that the, the role of uh, active party membership is declining. And yet, in the two recent uh, Freshers' Fairs locally, we had over 300 people sign up 
to join the Labour Party. So there still does seem to be an interest there, and, and people do still seem to recognise that the political party has a role in affecting change, uh, as well as some of the more direct democracy, the online petitions that we've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we've, we've seen party um, numbers go up, uh, but as a smaller party, though, that's in a small <laughs> puddle, frankly. Um, but the wider perspective, going back to 1950, is party membership is on a downward trend. Um, and so I think what all the parties looking at is how, what does that mean for the future. But people clearly are politically engaged. And so we shouldn't say this is people not interested in politics. They just want to engage in different ways. And we need to facilitate that. Um, and there are many places in the world where councils are run without any parties at all. And everyone's an independent. Um, I don't know what the future will, will bring from that point of view. But no matter what, we should remain open to being engaged online and offline and trying to be community champions. Brilliant. Well, we're, we're out of time at that point, so thank you very much, because I think in a week about Local Democracy Week, talking about what the future of, the de of democracy is going to be is a really important thing to do. Um, so let, let, let's see what emerges. Thank you all very much. <laughs> right. That's it.